conversational style make you want to listen more, laugh sometimes, and keep it not dead, right? So that was, that was my function. And we tried it the first time to a group of about three or 400 people, and it worked, we think, Gail, it worked, because we did it near, near to Christmas time, and it was her birthday on the 20th of December. We are boldly having a talk for women to come and say things about themselves. So we there, it, there was a little kind of trepidation like this, but all of a sudden there were swarms coming in. So we were good. So we charted another one and another one, and they all fabulous, um, full, and people in the, in the audience started commenting, and we say, there is a purpose. We are filling a, a spot, a niche, or something. Something, you know? And that is what my belief is, and her belief to some degree, that the Caribbean methodologies are formulae that we need to talk to each other about and use it as, as an example of how to deal with a crisis, how to evolve out of a situation without it being totally um, academic, academically in kind of going for a therapist. You can hear another woman's story and say, that sounds like me. I had those conflicts. Uh, I had those feelings um, about changing jobs, and I didn't know what to do, and I still don't know what to do, because you haven't decided your career path. So we found that it was working. Then we went to Guyana, we did Otu and Guyana, and there were like over 500 people. So we said, this definitely means that there is an opening for women to come to a space, and let's talk to some people who are willing to tell their stories and share some of their hurdles. And we had got, in the past, we got some very painful stories that people were willing to share and reveal. And that was really, really riveting. So here we are doing O2N Antigua. And um, it's aligned with the Miss Antigua Reader Project, which I'm here to do. And there's our delegates in the front. Let's give them a round of applause. Um, yes, well, it was really a preamble I was doing at that time there. It wasn't really to start the event. <laughs> and then I realized my commitment to the cameraman that when, I am, when I'm talking, I have to have the mic in my hand. So I'm being as real as it is. So I say, let me continue. We should start and hope that, um, uh, that the second speaker arrives on cue. You know, it works like that magically sometimes. Yeah, because I want her story told at that time. So our first our first panelist I'm bringing to the table here is Aziza Lake, a senator, um, who, like me, loves reading and literature. And we had a lot of dialogue that suggested I knew we were like minds and so. So it was really interesting to speak with her. And she's an action person. So too am I. So there was a, a bonding in thought. Because you know, it's a waste of time thinking about doing an activity and not get with it and get it done and, and to make changes. So I invite to sit with me Aziza Lake. Hello, Richard. Hi. How are you? They're very comfortable and close <laughs> to the mic so they can hear you. Because this is what it is it's just that inter discussion for us to know one another, to network, hear people speak, be close up in the face. Like in Trinidad, a lady get up and say, I come from quite sangry grandy, and I come to this hotel, this nice hotel. I never knew they would have let me in there. <laughs> Much less to reach in and sit in the front seat and see all them people, some of them people like that see on TV and thing. And I, there was a tear in my eye. And she went around chatting, and people were hugging her and talking and wanting to know where she's from. Her ordinary story was extraordinary to them because her life culture was totally different, you see? So we want to talk a little about you and your evolution, as it were, um, to become a senator. Because this is one of seven senators in, part, in government now, and she's a woman senator. So that is a very, very... Um, powerful thing. And she has seemed, from what she's telling me, drawn 
to controversial issues that brought us to the attention of the nation. And, um, you know, being called in by observer to talk on the Caitlyn Jenner issue, Jenner issue and, and such, and, and, and winning a, um, rights for a young person who was badly beaten unduly by pulling together a force of people to represent this person. So let us get into your story. Before I first asked you, how we end up in politics? How we end up as a senator? And you started your story. Tell me in that same way. It was quite invigorating. Well, um, I, I think you need to give a little background about myself to, to, to know where I reached the point in becoming a senator. Um, growing up, I, I like to read. And uh, mm -hmm. um, my parents, my, especially my mother, encouraged me to read. Um, we had a rule in the house that um, at least once a month, you need to read a book by a Caribbean writer. So like Zia Snipal, Miguel Street, I read Miguel Street, Lonely Londoners. So, and then I started getting into the classics, you know, Charles Dickens, Shakespeare, that sort of thing from a very young age. So, so from primary school, I remember reading Romeo and Juliet in its full form at the age of, I think it was 10. So I was very much into reading, and my mother encouraged me. And then I was very much into history and politics as well. So I would pay attention to um, international elections, what's happening in Britain, what's happening in America. So I always did that. I was a relatively good student. Um, and so I went to Antigua High School. Then after that, I went to Antigua State College. I did, I think it's five or six subjects. Literature in English, history, politics and government, math, Caribbean studies, and, and, and economics. And so, and then after that, I was like, what's the next step? So I went to um, Abbott and did computer science and engineering. Um, I love computers. And after that, for about two, three years, I was a network administrator at Antigua Trading Limited, which was a a very demanding job. They had three outlets. These are people that made Cavalier ROM, English Harbor ROM, and I was the administrator for all the computer systems, um, handheld, laptops, computers, everything that was electronic. In the, and so after what I got stuck in that sort of job, as I felt I could do it, but I felt unmotivated. So I decided, you know, it's time to take my um, education journey further. So I decided. So I added a newspaper. Um, the director of international services, Dr. Randy Green, was coming to Antigua from Midwestern State University, and they had a Caribbean recruitment program. So I said, interesting. Let me take advantage of that. So I went to Midwestern State University. I studied political science and theater. That's an interesting combination. <laughs> when you told me that political science and theater, but it also can be brought to, to a funny position at Politics is theater, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but it must be because theater is not really unreal. It is the art of performing yes, yes. and performing well, but yes, there's a ticklish point there. Yes, I also said politicians are actors. Yes, they must be. They have, they have <laughs> yes. to eat book messages and they have to signal things. So I did physical science and theater, um, which I think from what I liked up until that point, it fit my personality. I loved policy, I loved, and at that point in time, it, the Arab Spring was happening in the Middle East, and we were studying Middle Eastern politics at the same time, and so it was, it was very interesting that what you're studying is happening at yeah. the same time, yeah. so it was very intriguing. I was also there for um, the 2008-2009 U.S. presidential elections, so that was very much yeah. real, very a part yeah. of that, yeah. that um, Obama and, and, and um, that movement. So, and I lived in a Texas, a medical state university in Texas. And so it was interesting the politics and how it was done that's different from the type of system that we have because the U.S. is a Republican system. It's a republic with a president and they have the different, and we are the Westminster system of government. So it was interesting to observe and, and how they do things because we had a situation where the representatives of that area came to university and with the budget and we sat down with him and talked about the budget and what the things that they were going to do and what they should take out and what they should add. And I was different. I've never experienced anything mm -hmm. like that. And, it was, and meeting politicians, also had a, 
uh, speech with um, doc, Dr. Condoleezza Rice. Yes. The, yes. Amazing the, woman. Yes. So, like, experiencing all of that, so finished Midwestern State University, um, Midwestern State University, came home, um, and I was thinking, what am I going to do with a political science degree? <laughs> it's not the typical degree that um, people have. I know, I only know one other person that I've ever met in NCT who has that degree. So it had, there was a period of unemployment. Um, uh, luckily, my father, Mr. Patrick Lake, he's a, a lecturer um, at the Antigua State College, and um, he's a lecturer at Antigua State College, um, undergraduate, and the medical school. And he teaches about eight or nine different courses, and he also has a school. So I decided, uh, let me teach a little bit, um, get some income. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that for approximately two years. And then during that period, um, two things I said happened that sort of put me out there into the forefront. Um, the first thing, which is in a sense critical, when I was attending university, one of my best friends, Kyle Christian, he's the um, public relations manager at San Luis Antigua, and he used to watch the debates. He used to watch the American debates, he used to watch the Jamaican debates. I remember the one with Portia Simpson Miller, Miller and Andrew Holder. Mm -hmm. He used to love these debates and one another. Why can't we see that in Antigua? Why we can't have debates? And me and a group of friends, we always talked about it. And then we said, why are we talking about it? Why don't we just do it? Why don't we have a debate between the two major political parties? So me and six of my other friends, um, which is and this is with, with whom? With young people? With young people. Yeah. So Kyle Christian, myself, and Maya Athel, she's an attorney at law, Yendi Nibs Jackson, who's a sustainable tourism officer, um, Regis Burton, he's the Queen's um, young leader, um, and John White, he's a financial um, officer at Coker Bay. So we all came together and decided, let's do this. Let's put together a debate, and we had about 11 weeks to plan it. Basically, because we wanted to have it before the general election, when people's minds are in the, the mood to hear politics and issues and whatnot. And we wanted a little different. We didn't want it just to be the two leaders of the political parties. So we, we sat down for hours and said, okay, how are we going to do this? How are we going to arrange this? So we decided to make it youth-oriented. And so we said, okay, we want to make it youth-oriented. We want all the youth groups in Antigua to take part. So we actually sat down and sat down and thought of all the youth groups in Antigua. Then we, we um, I think we contacted the ministries and find out what youth groups are registered in Antigua. So yeah. we wrote to you, wrote to us, the GSI Antigua the sports clubs because we wanted church groups, like any type of youth yeah, group. So it's all inclusive. All right? inclusive. So we wanted to contact all of them. Um, and we wanted it to be also as well, to be representative of society. So we said we wanted a senior member of the party, a woman, and a person who is running for elections for the first time. Sorry. Uh, so we decided to be representative of society. So we wanted a woman, someone who's won a few elections for the first time, and a senior member of the party. So three individuals from each major political party. And we decided we had to have rules. So we decided um, we had to have be able to form a government. So there are 17 um, seats. So you had to have, be able to form a majority government. So those are our rules. And so we said, let's do this. Let's hope the political parties take us seriously. And we approached them, and they did. We had all the youth groups send in questions and from all topics, whether agriculture, education, sports, health, anything. Sat down, I think we started from 5 in the afternoon till about 2 o'clock in the morning, vetting all the questions we got. And then we sent it back to them, and they, to make sure grammatically correct and whatnot, um, invited the youth groups to attend, invited the youth groups of the major political parties, and we had, we did something that has never been done on that level, and the response was, in a sense, was overwhelming, because we didn't think, okay, nobody's going to pay attention. We are kids in our 20s, like, who's going to pay attention to, to what we're doing? And then it, the phone calls and emails started coming in, I think, ABS carried it live, ZDK, Observer, Vibes FM, all the major. Yeah, um, me there's a fascination because Twitter, Twitter, there was a Twitter response, and Twitter usually is not preoccupied with such <laughs> thinking. Yeah, that was interesting to me because I'm a Twitter is my favorite um, social media platform, and usually my Twitter is about sports, drama, gossip, 
Monday night television, as we like to call Ratchet TV. And then the night of the event, uh, we had live questions coming in and to see my entire timeline talking about this event. And we did it. We, we accomplished and something. And regionally as well. Yeah, we got uh, Caribbean News Service, the World Bank contacted us, and Amaya, she, as a chairperson, she went off for a conference um, hosted by the World Bank, I think. I can't remember the, the exact title of it, because of, of this event. Mm -hmm. So it p sort of put us in the limelight, so to speak. Um, I, I could say politically, because the running joke people have is like, when are we forming our political party? <laughs> and we laugh it off. Um, and then after that, I think the next, I would say, that's thrusting into the, the limelight, um, Clem Joseph, at that time, he was working, one of the producers, I think, at Observer. And it was around the whole Caitlyn Jenner interview. And he messaged me because they wanted to have a discussion on it. And they wanted to have a discussion on the striking on of Duma, which is Defense of Marriage Act in the U.S. And you know what I said, the politics, and he said, who's could he come and, you know, come and reserve a serpent show and talk about this. And I'm like, ah, Kadeem, that's a, you know, iffy topic in Antigua. He's like, he doesn't know anybody. There aren't really out there um, LGBT activists in Antigua. And I wasn't an LGBT activist. I dealt with gender and youth issues, but it's just something I was politically familiar with. I, I'm the type of person to read Supreme Court cases and decisions and, and, and that sort of thing. So he said, okay, I said, as a friend, I'm going to do it for you. So I did it for him. And then it, I, it just became that people knowing that I did that, people started calling me for other things in terms of um, gender and youth issues. And then I, I did a television appearance with a pastor that, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, on ABS. And that, how that happened, um, I had just started to work at ABS, and my boss, my boss, the general manager, is Erna Mae Brathwaite. And at the same time I was getting the job, she said, oh, I have this show on Monday night, called Monday Night Live. She's like, I'd like you to come in there and discuss gay marriage. I'm like, oh, that looks iffy, Miss Brathwaite. She's like, oh, don't worry, come, you can handle yourself and whatnot. And then I said to myself, um, I'm not going to tell anybody about it. So I didn't tell anyone. Like I told like one friend. <laughs> and she's like, I'm going to be an idiot. She's like, okay. And I think I told my parents, and that was about it. I said, nobody's going to be watching anyway. <laughs> so it's not going to be anything. But then you know how things go. It takes one person to watch. Somebody puts up a status. Somebody puts out a tweet. And then everybody's watching. And then I, by the end of the night, I, from my timeline, I swear everybody in existence was watching it. Um, and then it just came there that I, um, through different activities, um, especially charity, I was a member of JCINT, I was an executive member, doing a lot of charity work, and so I was sort of a public face. And, and how I became senator, um, my minister, as ABS is part of the telecommunications ministry, and my minister is the Honorable Melford Nicholas, he's my boss. And, as my boss, I don't really interact with him that much. I usually interact with my supervisor and Mrs. Brathwaite. If I do interact with him, it's when he calls me to tell me, oh, he liked a certain show I did. I think our last conversation was about the Brexit discussion, mm -hmm. and we had a show about Brexit where he explained it and the ramifications of it. And so he said he liked that I explained what the European Union was, because a lot of people didn't know what the European Union and how it's the biggest entity, you know, internationally and literally trillions of dollars on the world market simply because of a, of a referendum. And so I was literally getting my car serviced at the mechanic mm -hmm. and I saw a phone call coming in. I'm like, so it was a second of like, why is Mr. Nicholas calling me? I was thinking, did I do anything wrong? So I, I answer. So I'm like, so he, he, so he starts with, you know, he liked the last show I did. I'm like, thank you. I appreciate it. And then he starts to talk about when I finished from Midwestern State University, he had actually messaged me and said, congratulations, he noticed that I had studied political science uh, and, he, and theater. So he said, I hope that, um, he made a joke about, I hope that when you come back, you'll be on my side of the aisle. I'm like, ah, I'm not entering politics, funny, but that's okay. And so he remembered that conversation and he starts, I'm like, I don't, I'll say in the back of my head, I'm like, where is Mr. Nicholas going? And then he said, um, because, there's an opening in the Senate, 
And the Prime Minister, the Honorable Gatlin Vaughan, had asked the different ministers and cabinet to submit a name, and he submitted my name, and they're open to having me being a senator. So like, I had a pause, and I'm like, what? So I repeat that, sir, and then, he said, and then he said he wants me to be a senator. He thinks I'll be able to handle the position. So I went, I passed by my parents' house, because I said, I have to sit down and talk to my family and what have you. And, and interestingly enough, if you know my family, my mother's a businesswoman, my dad's a teacher, my sister's a musician, she has like three different jobs, and I have another sister who's a grad assistant for government. So they're never home at the same time. But that day, everybody was home. <laughs> so I was like, ah, okay. So I told them, you know, what the minister had said. My siblings immediately, yes. Like, they didn't even wait. They're like, they're like take it. My parents were like, if it's something that you want to do, um, they support me fully and go ahead and do it. And so, so that was a Wednesday. I mean, um, that was a Thursday. And so I thought about it for 24 hours. I said, I know it's something can do. It, it was an um, situation where I thought I couldn't do it. I knew I could do it. I understand how politics works. I understand how the legislature works. It was what if I was ready to do it. Mm -hmm. So I thought about it. I said, let me do it. Why am I? I shouldn't be afraid of this. So I said yes the Friday. The Wednesday, the Honorable Sarah Sweetie Benjamin called me on my way to work, and he's the Minister of Legal Affairs. And so I told my boss, um, oh, the Minister, uh, the Attorney General called me. She's like, did you do something illegal? <laughs> I'm like, no, not that I'm aware of. So it was that situation. Like everybody's like, why is Aziza at the Ministry? Because I hadn't really told anyone as yet. So I sat down with him. Then I met with the Prime Minister. And then there was a cabinet meeting with the senators that afternoon. And I actually had to go home and change because I was dressed in production wear. And the Thursday, it hit the media. The Friday, I had my, received my instrument from the Governor General. The Wednesday was the first sitting of the Senate. And the Thursday was my first presentation. So what is consistent what is consistent with Aziza is risk-taking. And you know, so I have to pull the story out of it, that every one of her moves was a risk-taking move. It was, yeah, should I do it? Should I do it? Yeah, it looked like a good move. Let me do it. I, I like politics. I like literature. I like writing speeches. I'm going to do political science as well as theater. And the whole point of coming back to Antigua and rallying that group of people to do that national forum, I think is so commendable because that is what is missing most of times in Caribbean spaces and Caribbean society. So that's the journey of Aziza Lake, how she probably never would have wanted to be a senator because she was not interested in taking sides, per se, you know? And risk-taking leads to success sometimes. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you.